good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you all for joining today's uh, Government Contracts Academy CLE webinar uh, covering intellectual property under government contracts. Um, I'm Gail Monahan. I'm a partner in our Dallas office. I'm joined today by Steve Mazziello, a partner in our Denver office, and by Eric Roberson, a uh, managing associate in our Denver office. Uh, we have a great program in store for you today. This is our second uh, installment of the Denton's Academy for the year. Uh, we're excited to have you all back and, and as well as to welcome uh, new participants. Uh, we're going to cover gov government contracts IP issues today, which is a, a complex topic uh, that we could easily spend hours uh, covering in depth. We only have one hour though, so we're going to try to get through it at a high level, run through the material somewhat quickly, and hopefully give you a, a solid introduction to the key requirements and um, emerging issues in this area of law. Um, I also want to point out that we recently published a briefing paper on government contracts IP in February, and it covers many of these topics uh, in, in depth. So it's available online. We can also help you get a copy if you need it. Uh, and then finally, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. Um, first, for the benefit of all the participants, the attendee lines uh, have been muted. Should you have any questions um, you'd like to submit during the event, you may submit them through the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if we can't address your question during today's webinar, we will follow up after the program, but we do encourage questions, so please uh, feel free to ask. It will make the program more interesting. Um, relatedly, uh, please note that today's webinar uh, will be recorded and circulated to all participants via email after the event. Um, should you have any questions at that time, again, you can reach out to us, but, but also it's important to note that we can only give you CLE credit for attendance during the live broadcast of the webinar. Um, regarding CLE credit, the following is a very important message. Uh, the webinar window must remain open for the entirety of the program, and uh, it cannot be uh, minimized. It needs to be at the forefront of your screen. WebEx will detect if you minimize the program or use uh, the computer outside the webinar software, and this will prevent you from earning CLE credit. One other important note on CLE credit, if you have a New York, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania license, Please be sure to listen to the code word given uh, during the program. When prompted, you will need to enter the code word into the chat section of the screen. Uh, if you don't have a New York, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania license, you can disregard this. This program has been approved for one general hour of CLE in Arizona, California, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, New Jersey, and New York, and it's pending approval in Colorado, Georgia, Iowa, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Virginia. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric to get us started. All right. Thank you, Gail. Uh, Gail mentioned we have uh, this is uh, the second in our series. There's a note here, um, upcoming uh, webinars in the series. And then I'm going to turn to today's agenda. Um, we're going to discuss you know, going into the background somewhat of just the legal framework um, regarding patents and data, uh, technical data and data rights, computer software. Um, and then I'll, I'll shift to, to Steve, who will discuss the allocation of those rights techn of technical data, rights and technical data, computer software, as well as the marking, you know, important issues in identifying and marking technical data and computer software to ensure it is protected uh, from unauthorized use and how to do that. And then we'll shift to Gail, who will discuss, you know, the practical pointers about to, to maximize your IP protection and discuss some of the recent developments um, that are going on in this area. So turning to just understanding federal funding agreements and where these IP rules are derived from, um, the, the primary uh, vehicles for which these are, 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 are occurring um, are through three, three, type, three general types. Um, they're procurement contracts, grants and cooperative agreements, and other transactions. And there's also other types of federal funding agreements that discuss the allocation of you know, IP, various IP rights in, in protecting you know, patents and inventions in cooperative research and development agreements, uh, small business innovation research um, programs, and the technology transfer program awards. Uh, in, in the context of a procurement contract, that's the most prescriptive of, of the type of rights that will be allocated between the government and the contracting party. Uh, it's you know, under the the IP rules there are set forth in the FAR and DFARS in Part 27 and 227, which we'll be discussing a number of those issues throughout uh, this presentation. Uh, and then 
Other prescriptions are provided for grants and cooperative agreements and the uniform guidance issued at, at 2 CFR 200. Uh, some of those are similar to what you see in, in the procurement contract setting, but there are some important differences in the rights that will be allocated in those types of agreements. In other transactions, is the least prescriptive. It's a the unique statutory authority it, granted to certain agencies, primarily for research and development, um, also for, for prototyping. But in those types of agreements, IP you know, allocation of IP rights is, is generally much more flexible and can be dictated kind of depending upon what the opportunity is, what research is being pursued and the level of protection that the contractor requires and the government needs. So moving into um, how to protect patents and inventions, what those are, I'm going to just be providing a brief overview of, of, of that area. So the primary uh, legal framework is set out under the Bayh-Dole Act, which sets out you know, the basic rules uh, and it's implemented through various regulations, um, both in the FAR and DFARS and, and elsewhere um, in the, the, the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, it's specifically, this act applies to universities and nonprofit organizations and small businesses. Um, by, a ma by a matter of policy, though, it's been extended to large businesses through executive orders, um, as well as you know, certain aspects of, of IP rights that will be implemented through primarily through the DFARS of is explicitly applying to large businesses. And we'll be discussing some of those more specific details uh, later on. Vital Act also applies, like it applies to both uh, grants and cooperative agreements, as well as contracts, and it does not apply to OTA. So as I mentioned in the last slide, other transactions provide a vehicle where there is flexibility to maybe either deviate or come up with creative allocation of rights that would not be specifically provided for in the statutory scheme laid out under the Vital Act. And, and the, the primary importance of this of this act too is, is really to provide the economic incentive for companies to pursue further development and commercialization. There was a, 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 a Congress had a report that prior to prior to the issue issuance of this act, uh, only five percent of government owned patents were ever used in the private sector. So this this act really reflected a shift to really commercialize um, and develop new technologies so that companies could. Could you know, could seek the protection they need to to really uh, capture their investments in in new technology when they're using government funding? So it was really a push to to have com companies um, you know, really invest more and, and reap the benefits of of that R and D effort. So the principle. The allocation of principal rights are in subject inventions, and that is when any invention is conceived or first actually reduced in practice in performance of a federal funding agreement. And this is an important first step in, in what is going to be protected. And there's been some uh, recent case law development on what that precisely means that we'll get into a little bit later in the ideal innovations case that discusses some of the disputes around whether something has been first reduced to practice or, or how that must occur in order to seek that protection of, of patent rights. Uh, generally, the contractor will retain ownership of the subject invention um, or the awardee in, in different types of uh, contract vehicles. Um, the government will receive in exchange for that a, a non-exclusive, non-transferable, irrevocable, paid up license to practice anywhere throughout the world or on its behalf. So it provides, you know, the. I think that the exchange there is the government will be receiving the right to, to utilize the, the technology and invention produced under that contract you know, to, to serve its purposes as, as it providing the funding, um, at least in whole or in part, for these for these new inventions. So um, there are some exceptions to the, these kind of this general framework surrounding subject inventions, and, you know, whether you know, the contract, uh, the contractor is located outside the United States, so there's some national security you know, if there's classified uh, work being performed or could be of you know, particular importance to the defense community and they do not want to release you know, this invention or, or new technology out for the public's use, uh, there's some exceptions to whether, you know, how that, uh, how, how ownership in that, in that area uh, works. Um, there's other agencies um, that also have exceptions. For instance, uh, the U.S. government will retain title unless a waiver is granted under certain programs of the DOE. Uh, other agencies such as NASA also have similar uh, statutory authority that will authorize them to, to take title to the inventions where 
under the Buy Dole Act, it's generally perceived that the contractor will receive title and the government will receive a license uh, for those for those new inventions being created. So a couple other relevant considerations. Uh, there are some conditions when the government may attain ownership um, under the Buy Dole Act. And that's where the contractor will fail to timely disclose uh, or elect title to the subject invention, um, or if there's where, if they're not exercising those rights to perfect their title in other countries, uh, the the government may be able to step in and, and take over ownership of of that particular uh, invention and seek patent protection on that behalf of the the contractor. <clears throat> Uh, other other requirements where uh, contractors um, must adhere to under the Buy Dole Act is the U.S. manufacturing preferences when they are licensing out the technology that they created. There is a preference for use of U.S. industry, so their 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 contractors are instructed to to basically license to to entities that will agree to produce or otherwise further develop the technology um, you know, substantially manufactured in the United States. Um, other issues about are within the margin rights that's related to where the, the contractor is not exercising or utilizing its patent, patented technology uh, in the most productive way that authorizes the government to basically step in into the contractor's shoes and may require the contractor to license that, that invention out um, when it believes it's in the public interest and other overarching concerns maybe regarding public health or, or national security where they require that technology to be for, further developed. So, so just a couple practical pointers um, about how to maximize you know, in your IP protection in the patent setting. Uh, prior to performing any any sort of agreement, you just you make an assessment and audit of you know what IP is is going to be utilized uh, either through a pre-existing IP um, or what will be you know created in the first performance of of the of the of the funding agreement. And assessing what you know what what steps you need to take in order to perfect and protect those inventions, um, either pre-existing or, or new, newly developed. Uh, it's important to develop procedures of how you would document subject invent in inventions. Um, as I you know, mentioned in the last slides, that failure to, to exercise and elect to take title in the requisite time period could lead to relinquishment of some of those rights that will you know, default back to the government if, if the proper procedural steps are not taken. And then other steps, you know, it will be you know, to perfect that is going to be filing the patent application both in the U.S. and throughout the world as, as necessary, and then filing the, the, the necessary reports on, on the utilization of that technology and inventions. Eric, if I might say a, a quick word in this area um, for for the listener, this this introduction might you might ask yourself, well, how does this come up? In, in practice, when I want to bring a new product to the government and have them look at it and test it and uh, determine whether or not the government has interest in, in purchasing the item, that scenario does create risk with respect to your inventions, even if some of the inventions are potentially pen patent pending. And that is because of the very broad scope of what a subject invention is. It's anything from conception all the way to first actually reduction reduced to practice. And that actually reduced to practice can mean that the that it's required for the invention to have been tested and proved out in the environment that, that it's intended to be uh, functioning in. And the government, if they are spending money and providing money to a new developer to help that new developer test new products or to uh, evaluate new products might, may uh, argue at some point that the, that the, uh, the inventions that um, relate to that testing contract are actually subject inventions, even if they were things that uh, have been 
mentioned that have been worked on for some time by, by the by the contractor. So it's important to do this audit that Eric's talking about and to get in front of your team to determine whether or not you need to take additional steps in these testing agreements, in these evaluation agreements with the government to ensure that um, your inventions that, that are, are not, that are, that are, should, should not be, are not somehow drawn into the subject invention definition, uh, granting the government significant license. Um, any, anything else in that area, Eric, you can want to? Yeah, I think that covers it. I think it's just, it's really just thinking about it from, you know, strategically from the outset um, is an important aspect of that whole, whole, you know, whole arrangement with the government. Um, that we can avoid some of the issues down the road of whether or not you've taken the proper steps. So I think you've co you covered it, you know, and highlighted the importance of that. But well, all right. Uh, I think we're moving into technical data, uh, or yeah, one more slide, Steve. Sorry, this, and this is just kind of really relates to kind of some of the recent issues in, in kind of patent protection. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, particularly at um, the members of the World Trade Organization about patent waivers for the COVID-19 vaccine that would allow, you know, non-patent holders without permission to utilize you know, the patent patent te technology to develop COVID-19 vaccines. It's related to how the government um, able to to exercise their marching rights in order to do so. There's also a separate authority for the government whether or not it's been funded um, by the federal government under 28 USC 1498 to issue compulsory licensing to third parties um, that would permit you know, not non patent holders to to basically develop further develop the technology create it mass produce it in a, in a variety of areas to make it more widely available and in that context particularly where it's of, of great national importance public health um, you know, health security you know, other types of issues um, that relate to that would that involve um, Basically, you know, taking over the the, the holder of the the patent rights um, and further distributing that technology for wi more wide use. <clears throat> All right, Steve, to pass it over to you now. We'll, we'll discuss technical data and computer software. Okay, fantastic. Um, why don't we move move to the next slide? First things first, to just to get everybody oriented, some, you know, everybody comes to a CLE with a little different level of experience and background in the subject matter. Uh, this is for those of you who may be on the call looking to figure out what is this technical data? What, what is this thing? Is this some new, new intellectual property that the, the, that the government created? No. Um, it is a licensing scheme. The traditional, the traditional law that protects intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, uh, and trade secrets remain. Tra technical data is not a type of IP. What it is is a way of managing licensing of certain types, certain very narrow type of information um, uh, in, in government contracting. And so what we're going to what I'm going to talk about for the next several slides is how that technical data and software rights license scheme and allocation um, applies to various types of funded federally funded agreements. And we're going to start first with agreements that relate to commercial items and we'll move into non-commercial item type procurement contracts and finally we'll, finally we'll address grants and um, cooperative agreements. As you can see, um, the, date, the, the definition for technical data is technical, um, but the key words to pull out of this term is that it's, science, that it's information of a scientific or technical nature. Also important to pull out of this definition is that all the other information, reams of information that contractors provide to the government every day, all the time, like proposal information, financial information, uh, management information, scheduling information um, is not likely technical data because any data that, that is incidental to contract administration, financial or management information is excluded from the definition. So in general, technical, it just as a general rule, it's not, uh, there, it's, it's not always uh, limited to this, but as a general rule, you can think of technical data as the data that relates to 
items, components, and processes and describes how they work and how they are made um, for purposes of, of, of this definition. Computer software, this definition is fairly broad, but it's also quite intuitive that computer software would include the source code, it would include other types of information that describes how the software works, how it's developed, um, how, how to operate it. Um, but it does not importantly include computer databases or the soft or the documentation that describes how to use uh, and uh, computer software. Next, next slide, please, Eric. Okay, so first, like, like I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about allocation of rights in a commercial item type procurement contract with the with the government. The, these contracts are the least. Are, let me. These these contracts are the most like a commercial agreement that that can be um, entered into with the government, short of a, a other transaction, which uh, we do not cover in detail in this presentation because the, the, there is significant flexibility, like in a commercial setting, in those 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 agreements. In this case, what we're talking about is commercial item procurement contracts with the government. And the first the first thing to to talk about is what happens to the technical data that describes the commercial product or the commercial item or the commercial component that is subject to the commercial item contract. Well, if the contractor accepts the DFARS clause uh, that is cited here, what the 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 ordinary allocation of rights are is that the government will get an unrestricted right to use, modify, and disclose technical data that are form, fit, and function, that describe the form, fit, and function of the item, uh, or that are necessary for the operation, maintenance, installation, or training uh, related to the item, which makes, you know, makes sense uh, from a DOD perspective. The government only receives a limited right to use, modify, reproduce, et cetera, uh, the, the technical data related to commercial item uh, but it receives apps, no, no right to use the technical data for manufacturing, of course, for that commercial item. That is if the contractor accepts the provision. Uh, in the civilian world, uh, the contractor only acquires those rights that are customarily provided when a, when, in, in the case of a sale of a commercial item or component or service. And that, uh, that is the general rule for commercial item procurement contracts. Next slide, please. With respect to software, in both defense and civilian contracts, the government obtain, obtains um, the following rights. Only the rights that it would receive in the commercial setting for, for software uh, are those rights, and any additional rights that the government might negotiate with the commercial computer software um, vendor. But those terms, those commercially consistent software terms must be consistent with certain federal procurement law. And those include terms in the license agreement that do not, um, are not inconsistent with the government's, uh, the, the government's policy on, on indemnifying contractors without uh, having specific congressional uh, appropriations available to accept that open-ended indemnity. That's obviously the software uh, license can, cannot uh, require the government to indemnify in cases that it, that it doesn't. It, the software agreement should, should not uh, include automatic renewals that would violate the government's ability to contract in advance of appropriations. Um, and it must uh, also include dispute and other types of terms that are consistent with federal law. All right, next slide, please. So that's computer. That's commercial item, technical data, and computer software. Now, moving into, again, procurement contracting, but in this case, the contracting for non-commercial items and services, where these are more unique needs of the government being met in the procurement contract setting. Technical data uh, in the defense contracting world is governed by the source of funding. And the, there are three types of DOD licenses that a contractor may grant to the government in the case of non-commercial technical data. The first and most limited right that the government would receive is in technical data concerning items 
components, processes, et cetera, that are developed exclusively at the contractor's private expense. And Gail will get into later the marking requirements for how this all works, but just foreshadowing a bit into Gail's section, it's very important to, to be able to document this, the funding sources and to have segregable uh, sections of your technical data um, that can be supported and shown to have been developed at, at private expense, whether it be from an IR&D project or from some other private source of funding, it's very important to maintain that documentation. Um, second type of potential, alloc potential license that could be granted in the case of non-commercial items is a government purpose rights license. And this is a rights license that would go along with technical data that was uh, concer concerning a product that was developed with mixed funding, meaning private expense funding as well as potentially some government development funding under a government con funded agreement, and government contract. And finally, unlimited rights are rights that are granted to the government in the case where the, the products were developed exclusively with government funding. And there are certain types of, of technical data that the government always receives unlimited rights in, and you can see a list here for your um, uh, later reference. Finally, a fourth, I suppose, type of allocation of, of license is where you might agree with the Department of Defense on a specifically negotiated rights license. And in that case, um, you, you may, may come up with a, a, a necessary um, uh, compromise, I suppose, in, in the case of data, that, technical data where the license, uh, the automatic license is unclear. Um, Gail, why don't you, why don't you, meant, you, you thought it might make sense to include a description of what private expense funding is. If, if you want to make that point, that, that would be great. Yeah, sure. It's not, not covered in the slide, but it is probably relevant and some of you might not know. Private expense funding means um, essentially costs that aren't charged as direct costs to government contracts. So you can have um, private expense that, that's allocated to government contracts through indirect cost pools, but it can't be a direct cost of a government contract. So, you know, a classic example would be IR&D. So you, you know, you develop something using IR&D funds. Those are considered indirect costs for government contract cost accounting purposes. They're allocated to government contracts, of course, as indirect costs. So you, you could do development under IR&D and it would still qualify as private expense funding, even if a portion of those IR&D costs are ultimately allocated to government contracts. Right, great, thank you, Gail, yeah, good, good point. Next slide, please. Okay, so just as a review, in this section, we've talked about technical data and computer software with respect to commercial items, commercial item contracting. We've talked about non-commercial items with respect to the DOD. Non-commercial items with respect to civilian agencies is very is, is could be considered similar to the DOD, but it, there is one there's an important distinction: is the government's allocation of rights to technical data and non-commercial uh, 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 non-commercial items under civilian agency is governed by when, where where the data was the the data or item or process was first produced, and that means loosely. And to kind of skip some um, some details to it, it means loosely was the was the item component process developed under a government contract or not? When was it first produced? Is the question you ask yourself when trying to determine whether or not, uh, excuse me, what type of rights license uh, would apply to technical data for civilian agency? In this case, there's only two types. In the civilian world, one is limited rights, and that relates to technical data items that are developed exclusively at private expense, not otherwise delivered under a government contract, um, and so forth. And unlimited rights, were very similar to DoD, where data was first produced in the performance of the contract. The 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 uh, technical data describing that development um, would be provided license to the government with unlimited rights. Next slide. Okay, now moving towards to non commercial item contracts for computer software. This can be considered very similar to the way that tech technical data is, uh, is allocated licenses are allocated. It follows the money, so to speak. Under the Department of Defense, 
With respect to computer software developed exclusively at private expense, the government receives a very limited rights, excuse restricted rights license that is very limited in nature. Um, a government purpose like rights license in, so in software developed with mixed funding and an unlimited rights license for government development for government developed software or software development exclusively with government funding. Next slide, please. For civilian agencies, uh, government rights are primarily based on um, when, when, whether the computer software was first developed under the government contract. The same essential um, allocation scheme is used for software in this in the civilian uh, civilian agency setting, as is for uh, technical data, uh, limited rights versus unlimited rights. Uh, and, and allocation of, of licenses are, are done that way. Next slide, please. Okay, in grants or cooperative agreements, we've talked about commercial item contracts. We've talked about non-commercial items. Now we're going to talk a bit about grants and cooperative agreements. These are a rate funded, federally funded arrangements that are for the public welfare. They're not for the procurement of specific goods and services for the government. Instead, the idea behind grants cooperative agreements is that the government is providing funding to ensure the to enhance the public welfare. So the rules are slightly different here, and they are they are skewed to providing the public with the with access to the outcome of those funded agreements. In this case, the government has the right to obtain, uh, produce, etc. Uh, all the, the data produced under a federal award, which makes sense in the case of public welfare, and authorize others to receive and use such data. Um, it provides for an opportunity for the contractor to copyright that information, however, to exclude or restrict third parties from copying the data. Um, next slide, please. And research data is 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 also also data that. Um, can be used by the US, U.S. government to develop agency action, and if it does, it, it becomes um, available potentially to the public, except for information that may may uh, constitute proprietary information to the contractor, trade secrets, or commercial contract, uh, confidential commercial or financial information. All right, next slide, please. I think it's before we do this, the code word, why don't, why, I want to ask Eric and, and Gail if there's anything in the allocation of, of, of um, technical data and software uh, license uh, rights that, that we, we might want to discuss, or if there's any questions at this point on these topics. Uh, nothing for me, Steve. All right, fantastic. Gail, if you could. Okay, so on to the, the COE code here. So for purposes of COE credit in Pennsylvania, New York, or New Jersey, um, the code word is rights, R-I-G-H-T-S, rights, R-I-G-H-T-S. Again, you need to enter that into the chat section of the screen. This is necessary for you to get your COE credit. If you are not seeking COE credit in Pennsylvania, New York, or New Jersey, you can uh, disregard. Uh, before we move on, I just want to reiterate questions are are very much uh, encouraged from from everybody. If we, if we can answer the question on the go while we're trying to get through uh, some of the material that that we're reviewing today, we will. But even if that doesn't occur, we we will get back to you with with responses um, and make sure that your questions are answered. So please feel free to uh, to type in a, a question in the Q and A uh, at any time. Or during the presentation. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to talk about marking requirements. And, and, and Steve alluded to this a little bit earlier, but marking requirements are, are very important because the general rule is if you deliver unmarked data to the government, then they obtain unlimited rights. So it's potentially very punitive and, and, and troubling for a contractor if you deliver you know, inadvertently um, unmarked data. Now, there is a grace period, a six-month grace period, but but that's it. And there's, you know, a number of cases. This this is a well-settled area of law. This has been litigated. This is, you know, there's really not any much controversy, excuse me, controversy on this issue at this point. So, 
This means that you know, it's very important for you to properly mark your data that you're going to deliver to the government. Um, otherwise, you're going to grant them a very broad license and, and, and severely, potentially severely diminish the value of your IP. Uh, next slide, please. So for uh, commercial data, there is no prescribed format for markings. So the, the rule would be to follow your standard commercial practices in, in marking any deliverables to the government. Um, this is actually one of the issues that's before the ASBCA right now in the flight safety case that we're going to discuss a little bit later. Uh, next slide, please. So for non-commercial contracts under FAR, so non-commercial contracts with civilian agencies, um, if you are required to deliver uh, limited rights data or restricted computer software data, then you need to follow the uh, prescribed um, format in the FAR for, limited, for a limited rights notice or a restricted rights notice to fix software. So there is a, a format you have to follow um, to the extent you're delivering that type of data to a civilian agency. Uh, next slide, please. So DOD, on the other hand, is uh, less shy about asking contractors for data than civilian agencies. So for DOD contracts, you need to do a couple different things. First off, you need to identify in your proposal any data that you intend to deliver with restrictions on the government's use of that data. So basically, if you're going to deliver limited rights or GPR uh, license data to the government, you need to identify that um, during the proposal phase of the contract. Um, and then, once the contract is awarded, you need to mark that data with, you know, one of the one of the very specific legends that are prescribed in the DFARS. Um, now, how you go, how contractors go about marking technical data under DOD contracts um, was actually the subject of a, a fairly recent Boeing case that we're going to discuss uh, in a few minutes. So, uh, Eric, if you'd go to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so validation of markings. Um, the government is authorized to challenge the validity of the markings you place on your data. Um, and this is true under both commercial and non-commercial contracts. Um, and as, as I think Steve alluded to this earlier, as a contractor, you're required to maintain records uh, sufficient to support the validity of your markings. Um, so for example, um, you need to have records that would support um, that data was developed at private expense in order to support your assertion of a limited rights license in technical data that you're going to deliver to the government. So it's very important that you maintain uh, and have maybe have a system to maintain, you know, records that, that help you um, su support your uh, data rights assertion. Um, next slide, please. So for commercial contracts, um, in order for the government to challenge the validity of a contractor's markings, the bar is, is pretty high. Um, first off, there's a presumption that the data was developed exclusively at private expense, though there are some limitations on that presumption, as you'll see here, with respect to uh, major weapon systems. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the first hurdle. But the second one is that in order to initiate a challenge, the CO has to have information that demonstrates that the commercial item was not developed at private expense. And that specific issue is one of the issues um, that we're going to discuss with respect to the, the pending flight safety case as well. Uh, next slide, please, Eric. Uh, so now we're going to cover some practical pointers about how to maximize your IP protection. And I, you know, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to run through these, but I invite Steve and Eric to chime in as well. This is obviously, you know, probably some of the most important content we're going to cover today because this is really the the nuts and bolts of what you have to do to, to make sure that you're maximizing your protection. So, Eric, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so with respect to the negotiation of data rights, um, a few points to keep in mind. Um, first, um, before a contract is even awarded, it, it's really important that you make sure that you are marking any data that you submit uh, to the government with a proposal or a bid with, a, with an appropriate legend, right? So we're talking pre-contract, if you're going to be submitting things to the government, you know, um, you need you should mark those. There are you know statutory protections for bid and proposal information, but there's no reason um, you know to 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 take a chance. So make sure that you're marking um, you know that type of data with your you know whatever your standard legend looks like, so that, that that's clear to the receiving parties that it's you know proprietary information. Um, next, um, make sure that you really understand 
what is going to be developed under the contract in terms of data and what you're going to be required to deliver, right? So this means that you really have to pay attention to the, the seed rules that are contemplated in the contract. They're going to tell you what, you what kind of data are you going to have to deliver under this contract, right? You really need to have a clear picture of that going into the negotiation. Uh, and then finally, Gail, not everybody's going to know what a seed drill is. Maybe, maybe explain. Oh, that. Uh, sorry. Yeah, contract data rights list. It's essentially a, you know, there's a, there's a, a bunch of standard and the, you know, the government customizes them sometimes as well. They're, they're basically spell out the data deliverables under the contract, right? So, you know, depending on the type of contract that you're dealing with, you're going to have a number of seed drills and some contracts have a ton of them and some probably have none, right? It's really just going to depend on the type of contract, but they basically spell out the types of data that you're going to have to submit. And some of that data is clearly technical data or computer software. Some of it's not, right? And so that's, you know, what is and isn't technical data is, a, is an issue that's actually before the Court of Federal Claims in the Raytheon case we're going to discuss in a minute. But so the, my point being, you know, understanding, you know, what, what kind of data you're going to have to deliver under the contract and what kind of data is going to be developed, even if it's not going to be delivered, um, is is very important at the outset for purposes of, of negotiation and understanding, you know, how, you know wh where is there room to negotiate and, and what kind of risk does providing that type of data or the type of data that's contemplated under the contract to the government pose to you um, from an IP protection standpoint. And then again, we can't really um, emphasize this enough. It's important that you maintain records to support, you know, what was developed at private versus government expense and, and to do this at the lowest level possible. Um, because if, a, if an issue arises, a dispute arises, that, that information is going to be critical uh, to supporting your position. So really it's a, it's a you know, the best advice here is that you really have to think through these issues at the outset in order to protect your IP. And it's outside of the scope of this presentation, but I want to tease one other thing is we're talking about bid and proposal and then eventual negotiation and performance of a procurement contract or of a grant or cooperative agreement or a commercial. We, we are not talking about other times where contractors may be induced or may consider providing some of the most important intellectual property and trade secret information to the government to informally evaluate it or to be make familiar the customer with your with your technology or your capabilities outside of a contract not in this presentation but it's important for us to foot stomp that it, that that is a very dangerous thing to do because of a variety of reasons. One is that the government only is can be sued where it consents to be sued. And there's lots of unfortunate situations where contractors have assumed that if they trust the government with some of their information outside of the contract setting, where that's clear that there's protections, um, they've found that it's very difficult to find an appropriate forum um, to recover uh, from the government for, for the harm. And secondarily, there's really no way to put the genie in the bottle. So, yeah, thanks, Steve. And we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of NDAs in a couple slides here, and that can help in the situation you know that Steve is describing here. But before we get to Eric, if we go to the next slide. Okay, so we called this one resisting limiting bad clauses. But I mean, essentially, you know, there are certain clauses that are more problematic than others, and. You know, this is going to require you to think through this on a case by case basis, right? Or I mean, we can't give you a IP is a complex area, so we can't give you a one size fits all, like, you know, never agree to deferred ordering costs. I mean, yeah, if you, if you could get away with that, that'd be great, right? Because it, it, it does open you up to future deliveries of, of data, even if it's not contemplated at the outset. Um, but, you know, as a practical matter, that might not be um, possible in each procurement, right? So, again, this is case by case. You know, thinking through these, being aware of these clauses, what they mean, how they work, and figuring out whether there's room to potentially negotiate them out of a contract to the extent the government has, you know, proposed uh, putting them in. Um, so these are ones, you know, that are on our, you know, resistive possible list um, because they can save you, um, you know, future headaches. But again, it goes back to paying close attention to the seed rules that are proposed to be included in the contract and understanding. You know, what is going to be delivered and what isn't. And then even if there's stuff that's not scheduled out to be delivered in a seed roll, is there a deferred ordering type clause in the contract that would allow the government to come back later and ask for the data, you know, at some point in the future, right? That's that's the another risk area. So 
you know, again, be mindful of these clauses to the extent you, you can, you know, try to negotiate these types of things out of your contracts, but, but understand that that might not be practical in some circumstances. Okay, uh, next slide, Eric, thanks. Okay, so this, this slide is, is on NDAs, and again, non-disclosure agreements can be an important part of protecting your IP, and, and, and there's a couple of contexts that we wanna highlight here where this can be really important. The first is that, um, you know, to the extent the government is going to receive uh, data from you and provide it to a third party support contractor, there's a mechanism in place where you can in help ensure that that third party support contractor is required to sign an NDA. That way they're under, they have a con contractual obligation to protect that data that you think is sensitive, right? And it also gives you um, a, a contract right against the third party potential, right? So this can be really important um, you know, depending, again, depends on the type of procurement that we're dealing with, but this, this can be a critical issue. The second one is, this is what Steve was kind of talking about, and, and there's a whole murky history of law and, and complex issues that come out of this, but essentially, if you're gonna be submitting any sort of sensitive data to the government outside of a contract setting, right? So not as a bidding proposal information, not as a contract deliverable, um, your protections and your options if an issue arises might be pretty limited, right? So ideally, Asking the government to sign an NDA, you know, makes sense. Now, they don't like to do this, right? So you should anticipate, you know, getting some pushback from them. Um, but, you know, as, as Steve has kind of been stomping his foot on throughout this presentation, Congress have gotten burned in this in the past by, you know, providing information to the government and not having appropriate safeguards in place at the outset, right? So an NDA can be critical um, in this space. Now, one other kind of pointer. Um, Ideally, have that NDA signed by a contracting officer who actually has authority to bind the government. That way you're not in this gray area where, you know, you get some non-contracting officer to sign an NDA and then it, you get into an issue of whether or not that person had authority to bind the government. That, that comes up from time to time. So ideally, you know, if you're going to be providing any sort of sensitive information to the government outside of a procurement context, you're going to get an NDA and it's going to be signed by a contracting officer with authority to bind the government. That way, something happens, you at least have a contract that you could, you know, you can sue under, and that would help alleviate some of the jurisdictional and other issues that, that Steve was talking about earlier. Yeah, the, from a practical perspective, being, pushing it towards a contractual mechanism, if you're having discussions, selling, selling type discussions with government customers and they want to see under the hood, Push it towards some sort of contractual mechanism where you have a right right to uh, enforce your your um, your terms with the government. Outside of that mechanism, it, it, you know, there's plenty of cases on. We're going to talk about them on patent rights and technical data and software rights and so forth. But outside of the contract setting, those cases are even more difficult because they include not not just um, what the definition of technical data is and so forth, but also where where can you even sue and under what statute and and so forth. So it's a push if you're in this situation where your customer wants to see your under the hood, push it towards a contractual discussion or receive an NDA by your CO. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Okay, Eric, uh, next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some recent developments, uh, emerging issues in government. We're going to talk about a number of cases, then we're going to talk about a, a couple of, um, of, of regulatory developments as well. So the first case on here is, is, is the Boeing case. So this is a case out of the Federal Circuit from about two years ago now. Um, this case is essentially about whether or not a contractor can place additional restrictive markings in the form of a legend on uh, data that it delivers to the government in addition to those prescribed in the DFARS. So in this case, Boeing had, had been delivering um, data to the government with unlimited rights, right? Because it was presumably developed under the contract. But Boeing wanted to place essentially an alternative legend um, on that data that was aimed at restricting third party use of the data without Boeing's or the government's authorization. So, you know, from Boeing's perspective, this legend didn't you know, purport to restrict the government's use of the technical data that it had unlimited rights in, but was really aimed at third parties. Now, the government didn't like this, <laughs> and eventually a dispute arose. Now, Boeing lost at the ASDCA and appealed to the Federal Circuit. So, the Federal Circuit held that Boeing could place the alternative legend on the technical data as long as it was aimed at restricting third-party use because 
The underlying regulations um, only address the allocation of rights and data between the contractor and the government, but not third parties, right? So in reaching this conclusion, the Federal Circuit uh, relied on, of course, the plain language of the DFARS, the Dash 7013 clause that deals with this, but also found important that, you know, at the end of the day, in the, in the data rights allocation scheme, the contractor retains ownership in the data that it licensed to the government. It's only given the government a license, right? And so the proposed legend um, provided Boeing what the court said was at least a bare minimum protection of that data, right? So they found that to be kind of an important um, concept. Additionally, the government rejected the government's uh, position that Boeing should have foreseen this issue arising and negotiated a special uh, purpose license, right? And so this is, I think, important because, you know, there are a number of I would say unfavorable cases where the courts have taken the opposite approach, uh, particularly where larger, you know, sophisticated contractors like Boeing, I think Boeing's been involved in a number of these are involved, right? And basically said, well, Boeing, you're a big boy, you know, you should have figured this out and we're not gonna, you know, you, you, if you, you didn't deal with this at the outset and so you essentially waived your rights, right? That, that, that type of issue does, the, the government made that point here and the, the federal circuit didn't buy it. So I think that's just kind of generally helpful to industry. And then, you know, in terms of the takeaway, um, this case would seem to suggest now there was some, the court did get, the case did get remanded back down to the ASPC to, to determine whether or not, you know, the, the legend that Boeing was proposing was actually, you know, going to cause confusion or, or, or somehow interfere with the government's uh, rights to use the data. But at the, at the end of the day, I would say that the Federal Circuit case stands for the proposition that, um, you know, you, you can place additional markings. Um, that do not restrict the government's use of technical data. It obtains, you know, rights to under the contract. Um, but I, I, as a practical matter, you know, if you attempt to do this, um, I suspect you'll get some pushback from your government customers. So I think it, you know, I think it's probably a, a something you need to maybe think about either on a case by case basis, if there's, you know, some sort of issue that you're dealing with, or and potentially as just a, a, a policy, right? If, if you're going to take the position that you want to place, you know, these additional restrictions on third party use. On your technical data, it's probably something that you need to consider at a pretty high level within your organization, and you know probably uh, it wouldn't hurt to grease the skids a bit with your customers about you know what their appetite is uh, to allow you to do that. Hey, Gail, just a really quick point. Very, really great briefing. So one of one question we get from a number of contra a number of folks, uh, of some nearly nearly universal universally is. Hey, my government customer has unlimited rights in this data. Can I even use it for any other purpose? And can I exploit it commercially? Well, how am I restricted? And again, Gail, you, are, you mentioned it in, in your briefing, but this is, as I said at the, in, uh, earlier, the technical data and software uh, rights scheme is a licensing scheme. As a contractor who developed the software, who developed the item component of process, you, the, the contractor retains ownership and title over that technology and subject to unique terms in your contracts, which there may be classification, uh, security classification, or uh, non-disclosure terms. You have to take a look and make sure that, that there, there's not something in there that would otherwise impair the contractor from exploiting it further in their other business. Um, contractors perfectly entitled to take that information, that that IP that it developed, uh, let's say under a government contract, and use it to in, in, in its other business and commercial business, and that that should not be, um, you know, that should that should be clear for for all, and that's partly uh, a, partly why the the, the Boeing uh, case. Uh, went the way that it did. It recognized this um, this retained interest by contractors, which is a which is a positive step. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Steve. The next uh, case here is the Raytheon v. United States. This is a case that's currently pending at the Court of Federal Claims, um, and it's one that we're actually handling. So we're we'll talk a little bit. I mean, there's a number of issues before the court in this case, but the two that are probably the most critical are one is the issue of the breadth and extent of the definition of the term technical data. And in that particular case, whether it covers, you know, basic supplier information, you know, such as the name, address, cage code, you know, et cetera, type stuff uh, that's contained in these vendor lists that were submitted under the contracts. 
So the government taking a position to that technical data, Raytheon, of course, disagrees with that. So that's kind of the, the heart of the dispute is what, what is the term, what does the term technical data mean? What does it encompass? A second issue in the case is whether the government properly followed the statutory and contractual procedures for invalidating markings on supposed technical data. Now, you know, that, that, that argument assumes that the vendor list constitute technical in the first place, which again is something Raytheon disagrees with. Um, at a minimum though, the issue of what is technical, so this case, you know, is before the court, uh, cross motion for summary judgment have been briefed, but the, you know, the issue is, you know, what is technical data and, and how, how, how expansively can that be interpreted? The government has taken what we think is a you know pretty broad view of that in this case, and and, and I've heard from others that uh, of, of instances where the government is similarly taking you know broad views on what is technical data for purposes of asserting uh, a license uh, in, in in that data. So you know from an industry perspective, this decision you know could be important in terms of either expanding or reining in you know the definition of technical data and the government's you know positions uh, with respect to what is or is not technical data. Um, and then, you know, to the extent that it is technical data, the issue of whether or not the government followed the appropriate procedures for challenging the validity of the markings is on the table as well, as well as a few other issues. So this will be this one to watch. Um, I think, you know, there's no there's no scheduled uh, hearing date yet, but we're hope, hopeful that, you know, we'll get some sort of decision on the motions for summary judgment uh, this year. Uh, the next one that we're going to talk about is. The flight safety case. This is another case that we're handling, um, and this one involves commercial items. And the issues in this case are, are kind of two. One is first is whether the government has authority under the relevant statute and regulations to challenge the validity of flight safety's restrictive markings on its technical data related to commercial items, absent proof that the commercial product was not developed at private expense. And in this case, you know, our, our position is that that's really not in dispute, right? There, there's no real dispute about whether or not the technical data relates to a commercial item. So the issue of whether or not the government even had the ability to challenge the markings in the first place is, is, is on the table here. And then the second one is whether the government can dictate the language used by flight safety in the restrictive markings it placed on its technical data. Again, as I mentioned, or me or Steve or I mentioned, there is no, I think I did, there's no prescribed format for how a contractor has to mark uh, technical data related to commercial items, right? And so in this case deals with that issue as well. Um, this one is pending before the board, um, you know, not, not clear when a decision is going to come out on this, uh, you know, hopefully sometime this year, but, you know, it could be some, there'll be some, some law coming out of this one way or the other. Uh, um, it, you know, we think this case is important to industry, you know, because um, one, hopefully it will reaffirm the statutory and regulatory language regarding the high hurdle that the government has to overcome in order to challenge the validity of a, a markings on commercial technical data in the first place, and hopefully solidify, uh, you know, make it very clear contractor that contractors have broad discretion in choosing uh, restrictive markings placed on technical data related to commercial items. Um, okay, the next one. Uh, we only have a few minutes left here. JG Technologies, uh, this is a patent infringement claim where the plaintiff asserted that the government uh, acting through a number it basically violated their patent. The, the, the novel or kind of notable issue in this case is that there's a number of uh, administrative procedures that um, a claimant can follow when they think that the government has uh, infringed on their, their patent rights. And one of them um, is, is under 35 U.S.C. 183, and it deals with secrecy orders for patent applications. In this case, the contractor had filed a claim for relief under that statute, um, was ultimately unsuccessful, and then ended up suing the government under Section 1498 for infringement. Um, the contractor argued that it's, it's the stat, basically the six-year statute of limitation was told while its administrative claim was pending under Section 183. The court disagreed. There's a, a separate um, administrative procedure that you can follow under Section 286 that does toll the statute of limitations, but the, the, apparently the procedure under Section 183 does not, right? So the court found this, thought that this was an issue of first impression. So that, I think the takeaway here is that, you know, because the government enjoys sovereign immunity and only waives its immunity in certain respects, uh, you really need to understand your remedies and be mindful of timing requirements or in, risk losing your claims as you know, the contractor did uh, in this case. The, the second one, uh, the last patent one here is it's another infringement case. It, it essentially deals with, it's got a kind of a complicated 
history, but essentially the issue is, you know, what does it mean for uh, an invention to be first actually reduced to practice? And, you know, the, the Court of Federal Claims ultimately granted defendants motion for summary judgment on that issue by applying a standard that essentially said that the, con the, the contractor had to show that he had built a, a fully assembled vehicle and, and tested it prior to the award of the underlying contract. The, the, the Federal Circuit reversed because they basically said that that, that decision was reached. The, the, the issue of whether or not the contractor had done enough to demonstrate that the invention was first actually reduced to price was, a, was one of fact that was prematurely decided at the summary judgment stage. So it was remanded in that respect. But I think the takeaway here is that, you know, the, the, the issue of what it means for an invention to be first actually reduced to practice is a complex one, and relying on testing alone poses risk. So, you know, if you're going to go that route, which in the DOD context might be necessary in some instances, uh, you really need to have a, a pretty well-developed and supported record to show when the invention was uh, first reduced to practice. And, and if it's entirely fact-intensive, one really good fact to have in your corner is a stipulation from your government customer concerning the, the whether or not your invention is act, actually reduced to practice prior to your funding agreement you want to enter into. Just keep that in mind as well. Yeah, and then the last, there you go to the last slide here. Um, there's a number of, of regulatory developments. None of them are, are they're kind of all percol percolating for the most part. I would say just real quick on the first one, there this one deals with co computer software, but it also appears to propose redefining technical data to more closely align with the statutory definition, which is different than the DFARS. They're similar, but they're, they're slightly different. So that is something that's at issue here in the first one. And then on case uh, D044, this one is another one to potentially pay attention with. It, it seems to be moving towards a, a, an update to the time period in which the government can, can uh, place orders for deferred delivery of, of technical data. Um, presumably, it's going to get get large. Currently, it's three years. It seems like it's going to get larger, maybe up to six years, to match what's in the the new uh, statutory requirements as well. Okay, so with that, we've covered the the the, the, the agenda today. Uh, thank you all for participating. Just as a note, in approximately 15 days, you will receive an email with a link to your CLE certificate. Your webinar uh, login details will be used to process these certificates. No additional steps are required. So, and as a reminder, if you're seeking CLE credit in New York, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania, you need to um, enter the code work. With that, have a great day. Thank you for joining us. Hope you learned something.